Mark, welcome. I know you're jet lagged. You've flown most of the way across the globe to be here. But uh, I think it falls to me before we start to explain a little, especially as I'm from a newspaper background, as you know, why this is such an important uh, session. Uh, you seem to have a taste for the hot seat. Uh, only someone who has a penchant for the seventh circle of hell would be Director General of the BBC. And uh, now you find yourself at the helm of one of the greatest and most uh, globally recognized quality newspaper brands uh, in the world. That is the strength of it, that it's a quality newspaper brand, but there's an inbuilt weakness in there, which is that it's a print brand. <laughs> And someone like myself who's been all over the world with newspapers, certainly in the West, witnessed the tsunami of the digital age combining with changing attention spans and witnessed the, uh, the, the efforts of people trying to, to uh, maintain loyalty and maintain revenue both at subscription and advertising level. You have been described by Peter Preston, who you'll know, a famous commentator, as in charge of the most famous metered paywall in global publishing. So no pressure. Uh, Mark, you've just had your Q3 uh, call. It should be pointed out that Mark doesn't answer to trusts or to private ownership. He answers to uh, steely-eyed shareholders. Um, how did it go? So the, the, uh, it, it, one of the interesting questions about uh, um, uh, a, 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 an Amer a, American newspaper is which line do you look at? Do you look at uh, sales? Do you look at profitability? Uh, do you look at numbers of readers? What do you look at? Um, one line which I think looked quite encouraging was our top line revenue. And it grew slightly. It grew just about 1% um, uh, compared to the same quarter the previous year. And that's important because what that shows is in the quarter our digital revenues, that's digital advertising, uh, about $180 million a year, um, uh, uh, digital subscription, uh, which is uh, uh, a little bit less, about $160, $170 million, uh, a year, that those revenues were growing faster than, than print revenues are declining. And it's maybe just worth spending a, a second on, on what's going on in print, because um, it's fair to say, um, here in the Middle East, uh, you're not seeing the aggressive trends which have been seen in Western Europe and in, in the US, yet I'd say that's partly a timing issue. Ultimately, the incredible take-up uh, we've heard about earlier today of mobile devices um, suggests to me that w within a few years what happened in, in, in America and, and Western Europe will happen here as well. But it, I mean, in the year 2000, when in the internet hadn't really begun its work, in disrupting the traditional models. One category of print advertising, help wanted, i.e. classified job ads in the New York Times, uh, brought in a quarter of a billion dollars of revenue, about $240 million of revenue a year. $240 million. In 2012, that had become $12 million. So you go from a model where you've got 20, $240 million with a 90% margin, so there's a vast amount of profitability, 90 cents in each dollar is, is, is gross profitability, down to a point where that revenue stream is just 12 million. And I have to say, it tells you a lot about the New York Times that despite um, that kind of loss through secular change in print, the Times has remained pretty profitable. But and it's partly grown profitable because it's actually been growing its revenue stream. It's been growing its both digital subscriptions and advertising. And so when I look at Q3, the single most important thing is in terms of sales, we're growing. Right. You, uh, uh, you do, however, sustain one of the largest newsrooms known yeah. to man, over 1, yeah. 1,100 journalists. Um, you have a commissioning budget, presumably, which would is the equivalent of the yeah. national debt of small nations. Um, and the, only, the, the key to your success, by all accounts, is this paywall. How is it doing? How many unique well, subscri so subscriptions are you it. getting? To, to me, to me I, I think the key to our success is the fact we've got a strong newsroom. I mean, I, I, know I don't think, it, 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 again, I think I'm sure people in the audience will know, it became a kind of doctrine amongst the owners of, of newspapers 
in Europe and, and, and America, that the only thing you could do, the only response you could have to digital was to cut your investment in content, to reduce your newsroom, to try and keep your costs below your, your falling revenues. And the New York Times, before I got there, but, but also since I've been there, has broadly, we, we, we need to take an intelligent, tough-minded view about costs. But we have a newsroom today, um, which even we're making some um, reductions right now, but it'll still be more people than 10 years ago. And I think the key to the Times' relative success is that we haven't disinvested in content. But you, you talk about the paywall, and that is important. So we, we have a paywall. If you um, look at more, more than 10 news stories from the Times, 10, 10 pieces of content from the Times a month, um, uh, we ask you to start paying. And the, the, the typical, the average uh, um, subscription, the average we're getting is about 16 uh, $17 for four weeks, which grosses up near enough to, to, uh, to uh, a couple of hundred dollars or so a year. And that model came in uh, three and a half years ago, and we've, at the moment we have just under uh, 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 900,000 uh, subscribers. So yes. it, it's, and that's, these are people who are new paying customers we never had. The, ti the Times historically had 1.2, 1.3 million subscribers. Now we're 2.2, 2.3 because of this paywall. But the, 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 the classic thing you're facing is what, when this thing shoots up and asks you to get out your credit card, mm. is your content strong enough to make them say yes, or to do the calculation which we know to be the case yes. from previous incarnations, say, well, I know this next product isn't as good, but I can't be bothered to get my, my credit card. You, you, you have a massive cost base, and you've just mentioned, I think, 100 journalists yeah. you, are, you, you are letting go. It isn't simply uh, a question of preserving journalists, because as you're also doing, you, you, ha you have to make new hires. Yeah. The question is, are those hires going to be on top of the journalists, or are they going to replace the journalists? Because coming from the print background, we would say, we're getting a lot of 18-year-old people who are fantastic at Xbox and, and search optimization. And for everyone that comes in, out of the door, goes someone who knows how to write a story and how to service public interest. And then you get into this cycle, the yeah. death spiral, which is that if you cut too much into the, uh, the journalistic base of a brand, especially one like yours, yeah. um, that people will not put their hand in their pockets anymore. So it's, it's six o'clock at night. We don't want to depress the audience too much, uh, and we, we want to try and avoid. I'm an old, I'm an we, old hack, man. We want to try and avoid. I've had people like you cutting my costs <laughs> off for years. So, 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 <laughs> so and it doesn't. It, it, an ex-journalist yeah, cutting, exactly. cutting, 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 cutting costs of the newsroom is even less popular than a, a business <laughs> right, person yeah. doing it. So, so I, it's, I, mean, I mean, Martin's raising a very interesting topic, which is, uh, which again, it may not be happening yet in newsrooms extensive across the Middle East, but my bet is these challenges are, are yeah. maybe closer yeah. than you think. Um, the, the, ideal, the ideal is, I think, to have a generation of journalists who um, have still got classic journalistic training and qualities and can still be trusted to do brilliant investigative enterprise journalism, to do great foreign reporting, to do really in-depth political reporting, to really understand and report business well and so on, but who also feel very comfortable with the way digital works. And some as aspects of this are already extensively true in the New York Times newsroom. We've got hundreds and hundreds, it, the newsroom's well over a thousand people, and we have hundreds of people Tweeting. T Twitter is one of those things, it's worked for journalists, it's a, it, 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 they, they love it, they love using it as a source, and they love taking part in, in Twitter. Um, um, we've got a, a great tradition at the Times of graphics artists who are journalists and, uh, and who can tell amazing stories through visual means, through infra infographics. Um, we've got now, the Times has had video and videographers uh, involved in the newsroom for for many years, and again, that video is, be is becoming a more typical part of what, what we do. But I would say we still need some great traditional journalists who are journalists who write stories and who do it in the traditional way. But what we need to do is we need, you know, over time to, to get a population of people who've got a range of skills to deliver what we need in journalism. And we also need a different relationship, a deeper relationship between the people who write the stories 
and the engineers who can enable them to do their journalism better by, by, by writing code, by adapting and making, making their, their journalism work on different devices, between the people who are brilliant at graphics design and, and user experience. I think what is absolutely true is journalism, which once was a very stable business, where the business model and the medium didn't change much over decades, it's evolving all the time now, and we definitely need journalists who are comfortable with the levels of uncertainty and the need for flexibility Agreed. which it now has. Yeah. And, I mean, to, to go back to basics, again, the, the background here, are you satisfied that the decline, the current decline in print revenue, both advertising and subscription, is being catered for, or will be catered for, by... The, 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 your current rise and future well, rise in digital I want to, I want to, I want to distinguish be, between those things. I, uh, d d digital advertising has been declining rapidly. There's some evidence print that, that, that print, print advertising yeah. has been declining. Um, uh, 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 um, but there's some evidence, actually, that the, 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 the curve of, 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 of print has been moderating in recent years. Actual demand, not for every newspaper, but for demand for quality newspapers like the New York Times is declining at a much slower rate. I mean, we see a little bit of decline in, mm. in, in, in uh, the demand from consumers. But actually, mo we know that most of our consumers, most of our particularly our engaged um, subscribing consumers, read the newspaper, but they also look at the times on their smartphones and on their desktops, laptops, tablets, and so on. And, and, and I think in a way, just in the way that books, physical books, still have a role in many people's lives, I think physical newspapers will persist. Especially the, here, yeah. Well, and it, and, and it, there are many markets. If you go to South Asia, if you go to India, for example, mm. there's probably a decade of, of strong growth in newspapers and magazines. Mm. So I think they'll still be a big part of, of, of people's lives. The challenge is whether... Well, two things. Firstly, can you get print economics to continue to be profitable? Yes. So, uh, I mean, I've talked and about... And you're doing it by raising your subscription price we, at the moment, we cover which has a... Cover, cover prices... work for so long. Cover right? prices, one thing. But also, mm -hmm. we're trying to innovate and develop print advertising. I mean, quite apart with... Most, yes. of, most of our innovation is, 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 is actually focused on digital in, 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 innovation. Yes. But we're also interested in doing some new things in print. Tell us about... Because the analysts were talking about something called paid posts. Yeah. Uh, th this is an interesting area for anyone trying to diversify their revenue. It goes into the whole business of... Um, Advertorial. To yes, put yeah, yeah, no, it, so it does. So, so we, we started something um, uh, this January called paid posts. And paid posts, it, it's also known, it's a slightly misleading phrase, it's known as native advertising. Yeah. And essentially, the idea is instead of a display ad, this is a, principally a digital uh, phenomenon, instead of a display ad, which is a separate box where there's an ad along, al alongside stories, native advertising is presented as we're in the stream of news. So you might have um, four four stories being previewed. One of them has been, has been is, is, a, is a, a story, i.e. a piece of extended content which has been paid for, and it's very clearly labelled, has been paid for by an advertising partner rather than by the, by the newsroom. And what it enables, it enables an advertiser, particularly an advertiser wanting want to build a brand, to do something which is a really engaging piece of content. I mean, the biggest criticism you can make about digital advertising is so much of it is kind of poor quality. Yeah. It's not interesting. It's sort of slapped on a on a on a website or on, on a uh, and on a smartphone. It's often so small you can't read it, um, and it's not very effective. And these pieces, these paid posts, are are intended to be really engrossing. And we, I'll give you one example. Um, the American company Netflix um, paid for a paid post. They, Netflix had a has a drama called Orange Is the New Black. It's set in a women's prison in America, and and they decided to flag the fact that the second series was becoming available, they decided to commission a stunning multimedia feature about real women in real American jails. And this was illustrations, animating graphics, it was video testimony from the women, it was a long written story, a few thousand words of, of story. And that became, for a couple of weeks, one of the most widely read and widely shared um, um, stories on, on the New York mm. Times website. Mm. And, you know, this is a business that didn't exist for us last year. This, this year, it'll be many millions of, uh, of dollars, and we think we can double it next year. And you, you've also branched out into New York Times Now, and, uh, yeah, we're, and we're, the, we're, the analysts have said these have been a while, they've sort of, the jury's out. 
uh, what we're, what we're doing up. is we're, 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 we've launched earlier this year a series of kind of parallel products. MIT Now is uh, a kind of express product. It's, it's, a, it's an um, iPhone um, uh, app which gives you a somewhat more compressed, uh, um, I think it's a completely brilliant product. Um, uh, we launched uh, in September uh, a, a, a tablet app which is based on the New York Times' very strong position in terms of food, food journalism and recipes. We've got a gigantic recipe base. And, I mean, th it takes time to grow revenue from these products, but I'll, I mean, cooking is an example. We launched in the middle of September. In the month of October, we had two million uh, unique users to this essentially brand new thing. So I think the, the demand is there, yes. but I think like most new digital things, you have to focus on building demand and building an audience before you can turn to aggressive monetization. And do you think there's a time at which your average New York Times advertiser will see the same advert on a digital platform and the same as, as of equal value? This is all about, this is all about yields, isn't it? And the, and the rate at which you're that, that's right. Your digital that, that, yields that, that, are catching right. up with your print yields. But, but many advertisers decide they want to use both platforms. They want to do, do yeah. both print and digital. I mean, we, we see very strong growth. We had some months in, in Q3. Um, uh, overall, digital advertising grew for us 16 percent, um, uh, yeah. or, or thereabouts, year on year. Print advertising uh, declined by about 5 percent, but the, the blended number was zero. Mm -hmm. So we held our advertising revenue because we're now growing digital, in this quarter anyway, fast enough to offset the print decline. Yes. Well, I, I, I think there's little, well, there seems to be a consensus in my rapid reading around the subject, yeah. that the New York Times, if not growing exponentially, is at least holding its own, which most other newspapers of this, in this predicament are not no, doing. That, that, that's right. I mean, because, because, because of the secular pressures on print, simply staying where you are in terms of revenue is, it takes mm -hmm. some effort. But I have to say, I'm quite clear, we want to do better. We want to figure out with a combination of the right portfolio of products and the right kinds of innovation in, in digital advertising and, and the right international expansion. I mean, the thing about the, you know, we often talk about the pressures uh, that digital's brought, but the New York Times was once a newspaper for New York City. I mean, it wasn't really available for sale in most of the United States, not even in the Northeast of America. Then it became a regional newspaper. Uh, and then in the 1980s, it became a national newspaper printed all over the United States. And simultaneously, the, 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 the Times company became a part owner and then the complete owner of the International Herald Tribune. We've now renamed that the International New York Times. So, but, but, and this was a paper re reaching an elite in America and an elite around the world, but quite small numbers. Well, now we have 60, 65 million people using it in one form or another every month. I mean, we, we, the barriers to entry to global markets for newspapers are far, far smaller mm. than they were. And for a newspaper like The Times, which has got genuinely brilliant international reporting, and it's a great insight both into you know, America, but also America's attitude to the rest of the world, we think there's great international potential. So another way in which I think we can, in a sense, make that that, that great big newsroom makes sense is by finding more, more readers around the world and more engaged paying readers around the world. And do you have a brand, uh, people point to someone, in, 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 uh, one brand that seems to be doing well, the Financial Times, um, which uh, seems to be going from strength to strength, moving people over to digital. Um, how would you argue, I mean, I, I certainly would if I was <laughs> in your position, that this is a niche uh, uh, that, that somehow it's easier for niche papers, you know, business. No, I don't actually. I, 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 and I don't it's got a touch, much smaller cost base as well, isn't I, it? I, the, the, it's a much smaller operation, the FT. I wouldn't actually, because I think in, in a way the, the financial newspapers, I mean, some really outstanding. I mean, the Wall Street Journal is a great paper. Mm. The FT is a great paper. Uh, but you've got now very big digital players, Bloomberg. And, of course, so many people uh, in financial services um, have got access to paid terminals with immense amounts of financial services. And it's, it, it illustrates one of these basic points about newspapers, which is that if you are in business or in financial services, you don't get news from newspapers anymore. Mm. Um, you get it from your terminal, you get it from um, startups like Business Insider. And in many ways, you look to a newspaper, even the digital form of a newspaper, less for simple news and more for insight, analysis, and comment. And I would say that the financial papers, they're very good, but they're in a very crowded place. 
Yeah. Oddly enough, outstanding international reporting and outstanding political reporting is actually slightly thinner on the ground. I, I would argue there's less competition. And in the end, I believe the New York Times has also got, although both the Journal and the FT have done a lot with lifestyle, I think the, the New York Times has got an unrivaled range of opinion, but also great content in areas like travel, like food, like design and fashion. And so our offering to our readers is much broader than simply news and opinion. Yes, well, uh, before, we wish you the best of luck with that, but before uh, signing off or going to questions, we should talk more specifically about the region. Now, uh, talking before, I said I think um, the, the newspaper or the print market here um, it's not a subscription market, it's primarily an advertising market, and there's a lot of advertising about, and it's doing, it's doing very well. Uh, traditional platforms are still getting a lot of uh, advertising, at least. I'm uh, less sure about actual penetration, but uh, so that, that, that's going fine. So we saw a chart earlier today which shows exactly. that although mobile and uh, digital and TV yeah. will all see rising revenue, um, we, saw, we saw print actually slightly declining in this projection over the next few years, even, even in this market. So, so in terms of with this in mind, with this incredible mobile penetration, 200%, with the yeah. fact that, I don't know, between 60 and 70 is, is yeah. smartphones, yeah. what would you say to your average publisher in the UAE oh, and I, wider? I, I think it's very clear that, 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 that you'd expect in this market, um, I mean, now's a very good moment to look at what's happening in Europe and the US. Uh, and uh, uh, make your, prepare your plans, make your plans. Mm. I mean, I think that the, the, the fundamental, uh, the Queen was talking about, the fundamental change in behaviour that we're seeing with, 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 with um, mobile phones and the way people use these, these small devices to, to keep up with every, every part of their lives is, seems to be an unstoppable wave everywhere. I, I'm not depressed about that. I think it, it, it's, it's something where if we have the courage to innovate and the, and the talent to, to, to figure out ways of delivering outstanding journalism of depth and quality and also the right advertising and subscription models, I think we can thrive in this environment, but it means immense change for, for everyone in the industry. It means immense change for what it, what it is to be a journalist. And, and I think, you know, I think there are, there are so many reasons, again, I'm going back to the uh, Queen Rania's remarks, why quality journalism matters. The world is, it's more important and in some ways more difficult for people to understand what's going on in the world than ever before. Um, and it's really important that quality journalism is available, but it's going to be, you know, quality journalism is going to be available through, you know, the kinds of things we do ourselves. It's going to be an awful lot of, I mean, I, you know, I mean, a, a good example would be Facebook. I think that a great deal of journalism in the future is going to be consumed within the Facebook app and within Facebook's environment. I think that recognizing that the pathway between you and your reader, you and your user, is going to be very, very different from this kind of owned and controlled manufacturing dis distribution system of old. And As long as the journalism doesn't get... Well, that's right. That, that's right. Lose well, out in that, the re rearranging of cost bases. Of course, that, that, so yeah. that's right. And, and I think crucially, the point, the basic point you're making, which is we will not cut our way to success. Mm. That is absolutely true. But we need a radically different approach to journalism. We also need a radically different approach to the business, to how you run the business and how you think about your costs. Well, thank you, Mark. Well, we're running out of time. I think I'm sure there are questions. Um, and we have uh, five. If you could just raise your hand and identify yourself clearly, please. Executive and entrepreneur. My daughter just graduated with an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College right up the street from you. Yeah. Is the uh, future bright for young journalists or has the ecosystem for young journalists collapsed such that that may not have been the right choice for her? It's a, re <laughs> it's, it's a, really, it's a really interesting question. I mean, uh, to me, it, it feels to me like that what's happened is it's never been easier in a way to, to, to become a journalist and indeed to post your journalism in ways that potentially millions of people can see it. We've, we've seen on, on um, 
platforms like YouTube and many other platforms, incredible pieces of fresh original journalism, which you can get to millions of people without having to go through the kind of the, the sort of gatekeeper of a broadcast network or a, or, or, a, or a traditional newspaper. But careers are harder, I think. I mean, I, I, I do think that being a journalist is becoming somewhat more like, somewhat more like becoming a novelist or becoming a singer or becoming an actor. Um, you can still yeah. have a wonderful career, but the uncertainties and the, the economics, I think, look very different from when journalism almost felt like an elite industrial job, but you had these very, very profitable um, um, platforms, these newspapers, and journalism could, journalists could unionise and they could get a share of the, of, of the benefits. That, I think that's changing somewhat. Though I also believe that where we can, keeping some institutions with a great kind of strength in depth of journalism and a kind of collegiate sense, sense of, um, you know, values and professional discipline is really important because there, there, there is a danger, I think, maybe, that, that we'll end up in the US with a rather brilliant academic structure of training journalism with exactly that kind of collegiate um, quality and the kind of sense of the heritage. And then the graduates will go out into this complete maelstrom where it's, it's very, very hard for them to get further professional support. So one of the things I'm very proud of is the fact that The Times is still recruiting great young journalists and giving them, you know, although not with the certainties of 20 years ago or 30 years ago, giving them great careers. And we have in our newsroom great journalists in their 20s and great journalists in their 70s. I think you can, we can hear you from here. <laughs> Mark, do you, see a, do you see a time when the New York Times company uh, would actually have to acquire some of these new entrants? You mentioned Business Insider, but Vice Media, Vice News, and several yeah. other of these new entrants that are taking, potentially taking away the next generation of audience for the New York Times company. I mean, I, I think our ability to, to attract the right individual journalists um, is is it remains unrivaled, actually. Um, um, and we have, you know, we have graduates of Vice, and uh, that's a slightly odd way of putting it, but there we go, uh, uh, and, of, and of BuzzFeed and, and, and so forth working for us, uh, Huffington Post and the rest of it. So there's much more interplay of, of people. I mean, my view is that if we, can, if we, if we, if we believe um, we have a strong balance sheet, if we believe that acquiring um, a digital startup um, is actually going to help us execute our strategy. And our strategy is about the digital transformation of the New York Times based on the quality of the journalism we've got, um, the, the incredible quality of the brand of the Times, and the, our, our ability to, to innovate and package those things in a digital way. If, if there's something we can acquire which is going to help us do that, or for example, help us with innovation in digital advertising, we'll do it. But we'll do it for straightforward operational and economic reasons. And so, ma so many digital startups are valued in a slightly different way um, uh, that it's, it's, I think it'll be quite a rare activity. It's not part of our strategy to build a, a, a portfolio of digital startups. Please don't turn the New York Times into BuzzFeed. Um, thank no, we, you. We've got a different mission, but, but the point of, I'm so sorry. We've got a different mission, but the point about BuzzFeed is, is there's some really interesting tactics and, and uh, uh, things going on with BuzzFeed. And I will say about BuzzFeed, by the way, there's a kind of sense of humour, there's a wit about BuzzFeed, which people who, who don't watch it regularly don't see. But I think, I mean, some interesting work going on at BuzzFeed. But no, we're not going to, we're not going to make the Times sorry. BuzzFeed. So my sorry. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ethna Trainer. I'm a former journalist, having worked at BBC World, Sky, mm. Bloomberg, CNBC. And um, I'm interested that you're saying you're getting so much money on the paid for editorials, which we're beginning to see not just on yeah. newspapers, but on television and everywhere else as well. There was a time when there was a big divide between church and state. And I don't think that the majority of readers out there sometimes understand that they're reading paid for editorials. Um, is there not a little bit of a, perhaps, a moral dilemma there? I'm delighted it's making lots more money for the newspapers and keeping I think, I think you've got to, I think it's in everyone's interest, including the advertisers, that it's incredibly clearly labelled, incredibly clearly labelled. And I, I think, you know, you should always, I think, as long as it's clearly labelled, I think it's no more, no more risky than the advertorials we've had in newspapers 
certainly in the Times' case, since the 1950s. I think the Guardian's uh, doing a lot of it as well. Yeah, but, uh, making uh, look, good money. To, to be quite clear, ev almost everyone is 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 looking at this because it it it, it essentially we believe it has more it's going to be more effective in the medium term um, for advertisers for our partners than tradition what i can call traditional digital display advertising um, and in my view as long as it's clearly labeled uh, and there's no you know as it were you know confusion or infection of this to straight news i think it's fine um, and it doesn't really raise many more issues than an advertisement sitting right next to a news story in a, dis in a display sense. But, I mean, you're right to ra I mean, raise it as a question, but it, it's, it's, it, it, I, I don't know of a major newspaper group in the US which is not doing this now, really. Anyone else? Over there. Hello. Um, the, the, uh, like, I think that one of the reasons why the New York Times lasted so long, even though they were losing, you know, kind of losing subscribers and whatnot for a long time, is because of their brand. And, um, and I feel that sometimes people buy the newspaper because of, because of that association they have with it. Uh, they, might have, they might lead the same type of lifestyle that, you know, th through the paper, it's kind of the lifestyle that they're pushing or the yeah. kind of thinking that they're pushing. Um, and there are various types of businesses that were able to leverage the brand they had in other ways and make themselves a lot of money, in, but in ways that were unexpected. And I want to highlight a few of them. For example, um, Rovio, the, the gaming um, Angry Birds uh, game, uh, were able to do toys. And then they were able to sell those toys. They're making a lot of money from that new, new, um, new revenue stream. Um, there was also... Um, you know, there's a few other ones. For example, take Disney, for example. They look at, that's how they structure their business. There's one brand, let's say it's a cartoon, and then they go out and they do a million things with it. Hotels, yeah. cafes, and a yeah. million things. Um, and I was wondering, you have a very strong brand, and have you, have you thought of um, uh, taking that brand and, for example, licensing it for someone to create a cafe or for, for people to uh, create a hotel with it? It might be a weird idea, but there are even publications today that are that are doing this sort of stuff in fashion, for example. So, so, so the idea of extending the brand, I think, is is something we we absolutely um, we, we 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 do think that's. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe it's it fundamentally means you can forget the the core challenge of getting your news offering itself to work effectively in in digital. But we have a, 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 a successful conference business that's grown very substantially in recent years. Um, we are, our video business is leading us into television and the production of TV shows. Um, I talked about the cooking app and we have um, great ambitions for what we can do with some of these verticals. Um, and that will involve, um, already does involve, some elements of partnership and, and licensing. So although I think that when you've got a brand which stands so clearly for high quality impartial news, you, you, your, your brand extensions have to be themselves, they have to live up to what that brand stands for. And we probably are therefore have got rather less um, room for maneuver than some other successful brands. But definitely, I, I, see, I see the extending of the brand in a kind of judicious way as being one of the ways in which we can grow the company. I think unless there are burning questions, we've, we've overrun. Um, Mark, we wish you the best you. with everything. I mean, the success of the New York Times is about more than the success of a newspaper in America. It's uh, about the success of public interest, journalism, and all that that lends to civil society. And uh, sure, I speak for everyone, wishing you the best in your Thank you, efforts going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin and Mark. Thank you.